All right, everybody. Um, I am so excited to bring to you today my friend Kim. Now, Kim and I met originally, it's been a few years ago, but we met at a Mike Dooley conference that is like a train the trainer for his infinite possibilities program. So both Kim and I were there. And on the very last or the last evening of the event, he has a big come as your future self party. And both Kim and I came as future authors. And I was so impressed with what Kim did because she made herself a prop with the book of her future book. And um, I'm hoping to get the status of that book from you today. Aside from that, um, Kim did an amazing TEDx talk. And I just have to tell you that Kim's TEDx talk had such an effect on me that I actually used it to, re if you know me at all, you know I'm like the queen of reverse engineering work instructions. So I actually used her TED talk because I thought it was so perfectly delivered that I used it. Um, I, I reversed outlined a sort of like a, you know, like a speech outline. And I've actually used that as the foundation when I bring these trainings to you that I actually give them that outline, which is based on Kim's TED Talk. So at some point in the day, we'll get you a link to Kim's TED Talk so that you can hear it for yourself. I thought she did a great job. She was personally invited to apply. I watched her journey. It was very, very exciting. Kim has also moved overseas to experience a world of location independence entrepreneurship. So that's quite a mouthful. And she really <laughs> does um, embody that unconditional living style. So to create, she wants to talk to people about creating their life on their terms and live audaciously in the pursuit of happiness. So I'm going to give it over to Kim. And what I've asked her to do today is just like really bring you the elements of that amazing TED Talk. So take it away, Kim. Mary, thank you so much for having me. It's always so fun to catch up. Uh, I have to give you major props because I'll, the book update. <laughs> we'll, we'll start with that. Okay. I'm at about 50,000 words into my first draft, which might not be that many more since the last time we chatted. So I can completely empathize with what the process is like to get that painful first draft out, to make this thing like come to life. And seeing it on your desk is testament to all the work that goes into it. And so I just have to acknowledge you for that because I know how hard it is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, and I'm so proud of you too. So, and I can also tell you, there are definitely times where you put it down for a minute and, and that's okay because yeah. sometimes the information comes to you that you need, but I'll tell you a little secret. Um, when you have a contract with the major publisher and a deadline, it really helps you get the shit done, right? <laughs> I know. I know that that's, <laughs> that's honestly one of the biggest pulls for me in looking into a traditional publisher is just to have that accountability and that support. I'll give and you a deadline. Yeah, is that what no, you that'd be helpful. I'll give you a deadline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't know if anyone can notice, I don't have the sexiest background today because as Mary said, I'm you know, location independent. I can kind of work from wherever. And I happen to be in California this week. So, uh, you know, we just make it work where we are, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, to jump on with you today before I, I head to the airport in a couple hours. So thank you again for having me. <laughs> well, where are you going? Uh, I'm actually headed back to Austin. I was in California for a conference and, uh, you know, that's part of, part of the big tenets of my business is just always putting myself around people who are like-minded and continuing that education. So whether it's picking up Mary's book or picking up a course that resonates with you or, you know, hopefully not too long from now, picking up my book, it's getting on these webinars and getting that information so that you can continue to fuel that, that interest, that passion to have a better life. So with that, I'm happy to jump into the training. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, well, my intention for today was not to regurgitate the entire TEDx talk because I would love for people to go and check out that in its entirety on YouTube. But I do feel really passionate about the three ways that you can avoid regret in your life. So we are going to dive into those a little bit. Awesome. Go ahead. Did you have something to oh, say? I just want to say that um, I think that this is a powerful topic because 
you know, sometimes I know with myself, there's times that I really toss a decision like a ping pong table or a ping pong game in my mind, yeah. like, should I, shouldn't I? And I think it's that sort of worry about, about that regret. Like, I don't want to regret something later. So I'm just agreeing with you that this is a powerful topic and I cannot wait to hear this information. Thanks so much. Awesome. Well, Real quick before I dive in, just talking about the structure of the speech, before I was preparing for the TEDx talk, and I've had a lot of people approach me since doing it because they too have a similar goal or dream, and they're like, how did you get it? How did you prepare? You know, what makes a good TEDx talk? So I'll, I'll pass you the link as well, Mary, but I have a blog post on my site where I talk about how I pursued the opportunity you know, overcoming the fear to speak on a stage like that. And then actually the research that I did to create the structure of the talk, because uh, I, I watched a lot of other TEDx talks. I read books on the topic. So we'll pass that information as long, uh, along as well. Can you guys see why I love Kim so much? I mean, this is, this is what the new paradigm of empowerment looks like, that when we see people doing similar work, we help each other and we collaborate yeah. and it's not, it's not a competitive atmosphere. So I will take you up on that, girl. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So diving in, you know, I'm one of those people who has always had this innate ability to be assertive and to say what I want, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I haven't been scared of what other people will think of me. And I think that ultimately that's what holds us back the most from the things that we want in life is that fear of being rejected by the people that we love, the fear of failing at whatever it is we're going after, and whatever other like limiting beliefs bubble to the surface that just keep us stuck. So one of the things that I mentioned in the talk is that there was a study done at Cornell where they interviewed people in their late 70s, um, I think maybe early 80s, and they asked them at the end of their lives, like, if you could go back, what would you do differently? And what they found was that 12% of the people interviewed regretted things that they had done, you know, actual things that they had taken action on, but 54% had regretted things that they didn't do. So what that study can illustrate is that we all face this, this like internal struggle of like missing out on things, that FOMO of the stuff that we wish we had done. And if you don't address it, if you don't take action, if you're not fearless, that can actually stick with you until the very end of your life. You know, people weren't remembering 60 years from now that like embarrassing moment they had or that like one flop where they went after something and it didn't quite pan out what stuck with them were like those things that they they wish that they had acted on the people they wish they'd talked to the dreams they wish they'd pursued and that really stuck with me when i when i found that out because my mission with the bold life movement is to help people be more open, be more audacious, be more bold in the pursuit of their dreams. And so seeing evidence that like, this is something that actually can affect you 50, 60, 70 years from now, that resonated with me. So the first thing that, uh, that I, I really like to drive home when we're talking about avoiding regret and going after what you want is just having the audacity to ask for it. I think a lot of us, um, you know, on, on the, the basic level might not even know what it is that we want. So first you need to get clear on what is that passion that you want to turn into profit? What is that, that crazy dream that you've been thinking about that doesn't seem to leave your head that you're, that you think about right before you fall asleep, you think about when you wake up, but you're still not acting on getting clear on those at, at first is, is one of the most basic things. So getting clear on your desires and then asking for it. So whether that's asking for the raise at work or asking your partner if you guys can move across the country for a job that you're really passionate about or asking, I even say this in the talk, asking the hostess at a restaurant if you guys can just have a better table. You know, like that seems so simple and so obvious to me, but so many people just feel this like, I'm going to impose, um, I don't deserve this. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I, I would never be as successful as he or she is. And so I think that it's really important to, to recognize people can't say yes until you ask. 
One of my favorite stories is uh, my mom's birthday a couple of years ago. I wanted to do something really special for her. We, we don't live in the same state, so we'll typically jump on Skype or something and, and have a little like dinner date. I'll order pizza to her house, I'll order pizza to my house, and we just get on and we chat. But I wanted to deliver her something that was unique. And I thought, okay, she loves this Australian TV show. And there's one particular actor on this show that she's really, really, you know, keen on and has flown over to Australia multiple times to visit with the crew and go to all these different events that they seem to have. And I thought if I could get him to send her a message, that would be really, really special. And so I just reached out on Instagram. You know, it's, it's 2018. We can reach people that 10, 15 years ago were completely inaccessible, whether that's Twitter, email, Instagram DM, Facebook DM, it doesn't really matter. Like you have so many uh, options on ways to make the ask that there's really no reason not to. So in the end, I ended up reaching out to him and he was so kind. I sent him a very short video just saying, hey, tomorrow's my mom's birthday. I know you've met her. She's a big fan of yours. If you could send her a short video saying happy birthday, that would be amazing. And he ended up sending back the sweetest, most thoughtful, like 20 second video and on our little birthday skype date i i was able to send it to her and i got to see her reaction and if you watch the tedx talk you can see her just like losing her mind as she's watching this video from him it was so sweet yeah so i'm i'm curious if there's anything i'm flipping the script here mary i'm curious if there's anything in your life right now that you could be asking for that you haven't yet well, thank you for asking. There, there are some things and I just, you know, I feel like I want to um, represent the idea of fearless ambition. And so I think that that's why it's so easy for you and I to be aligned because fearless doesn't mean necessarily that you have fear or that you have no fear. Um, fearless simply means that you act in spite of that fear. So you ask for things even if you have that fear. And I know like, it's so interesting because my son has this thing and um, he says, I don't know who he heard it from, but probably a basketball player, but he says, mom, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. And so I think that in some areas of my life, and this might be true for, for anyone listening, um, and we just, we have several people watching on our Zoom and we also have people watching on Facebook Live. So that's always fun. But um, in some aspects of life, I have no problem asking. Like I have no problem at all asking for the table I want. Like if I want to sit by the window or I want to sit yeah. on the patio, because I know that that's going to enhance my experience. Um, yeah. I have no problem asking to change my order at a restaurant. I have no mm -hmm. problem asking, but sometimes where I do get tripped up is if I'm asking something of another person that I know that maybe it's not what they want me to ask of them, mm -hmm. so, you know, but I know that it's the right thing. So being a CEO, there are times in my position, I have to hold people accountable to, to their things. And so that can get a little bit uncomfortable in general. I think that when there's a fear that the person might feel put out or there's a fear that someone will tell you no, that will be an immediate thing that will hold you back. And so there are so many things you can do to get yourself over that hump, like maybe writing a little script for yourself mm -hmm. or thinking of an alternative way. Like you could have written this guy a letter from the Australian television show and it wouldn't have done any good, but because you did something that made you stand out, yeah. then you got noticed and you got noticed in a big way. And I just, um, I appreciate that. And yeah, so let me think if there's something specific. Um, actually, I have my second book proposal that um, I need to submit to Hay House. Yeah. And so I, I haven't done it yet. I'm not sure what I'm waiting for, but I definitely sometimes resist the urge to ask them to do things for me. Like for example, mm -hmm. marketing or um, wanting to speak on more of their stages because I do the ping pong thing in my head. Yeah. Well, you know, Reed probably has all the authors bugging him for that. And you know, I did get to speak at the Hay House uh, Writers Workshop, which was a thrill for me, but I know that if I can speak at more Hay House events, that that's going to do great things for my career. So, you know, it's about me. I need to make it about them. So you can see how I like toss this back and forth. Yeah. So it's probably one of the only things right now. 
Well, here, I love the way you just phrased that. You said, it's about me. I need to make it about them. One of the biggest takeaways that I had from the conference I was just at, it was a Brendan Burchard marketing conference. Um, love him. Check him out if you're not familiar. He said, if you are not pitching your stuff, or for you, in your case, if you're not asking them to get on stage, then that means that all the people whose lives could be touched and affected by your book, that's not happening yet. You know, people who, who you could be impacting are not coming in contact with your brand because the ask hasn't been made yet. So if there's ways that you can shift it to making it about the readers and then conveying that when you make the ask to Hay House, it's like it resonates even more with you and the publisher because that's their goal too. You it's know? so true. Hey, do you want to hear something really cool before we move on to the next? Always. One? Okay. So I actually got my first author's statement. Um, so it's like a statement that you get with royalties and things, but because okay. I got an advance, you know, the way that it works in the book publishing world is you have to, you don't get, it's kind of like commission. You don't make more money on your royalties and still until it goes above the amount of your advance. So oh, I got okay. my first statement though. And in the last quarter of 2017, which was the, when my book came out, I sold 5,007 books. That's insane. I don't know Five. if it's a good number or not, but I was like, I'll take it. <laughs> that's halfway to a New York times bestseller. That's an amazing number and you number or not, that's 5,000 people that read your book. Yeah. So and, and you could see 5,000 people in a stadium, all of those people, you know, learning the power of their words and having their lives changed and that. That's huge. Yeah. Oh, it feels. felt, it felt really good, Kim. And you're the first, you're the first person I'm like announcing that too, but yeah, it, it felt super cool. And, and, um, I was really proud of it. I, it was a proud yeah. moment. And you know, I've, I've got this daily desires thing where I really encourage people every day to say three things that they're proud of. And so I was really proud of that. That, that yeah. felt really good. You okay, probably so can't see because my camera is crap on my computer, but I'm like getting emotional. I think that that's incredible. Aww, you're like, you. every time we connect, people who are watching, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen my, my interview with Mary before, but Every time we connect, it's like kindred spirits. And if you haven't read her book, read it. I'm like completely motivated to repick it back up on my flight home because I remember how much it was impacting me when I was reading it in preparation for our podcast. So yeah. I'm super proud of you. I hope that you can continue celebrating that because 5,000 readers is incredible. I thought it was really good. Yeah. And um, I really appreciated because you were one of the first people who really expressed to me that how much the sharing of my personal stories, how much that meant to you. Um, and I appreciated that because when you're writing, you know, sometimes it can be this vulnerable thing. And as you and I even had the conversation, you're not really sure because especially there are people in your family that are still alive, fortunately, yeah. we. but you don't want to out people to a level of of alienation and so there's these weird writer things that you go through but you were you were one of the first people and and i remember the moment because you had tears in your eyes mm -hmm. as you were telling me how these stories affected you and and of course as a lot of people that i know through through that community and kim and i also know each other through tony robbins um yeah. she had no idea that i had that kind of a background so yeah i mean was, you meet at these events and you get to know each other as much as you can in that short period of time but we hadn't gotten that depth so um, part of why it was so moving for me reading your story in your book was because that's a huge piece of why I'm delaying the release of my book. And, and I recognize that without being completely transparent, without sharing very specific stories, the impact won't be the same. The lessons will not have as much, um, I, I don't know, they just won't be as impactful. And so I'm very inspired by that. And, and I think that that, you know, that kind of plays into the whole theme here. You know, um, I'm going to jump ahead to point number three, just because it's relevant. Now, I think that one of the bravest things that you can do, one of the boldest things you can do to avoid regret is to just trust your own instinct, to trust your own gut. And sometimes that doesn't, that doesn't mean you're going to do something that's not scary, but if you feel called to it, you felt called to share those stories about your family, then there's a reason. And, you know, your sharing that inspired me to be more vulnerable. And every time I'm vulnerable in my brand, people reach out, you know, people are, I've done podcast episodes recently that are radically different from anything I've done in the past. And 
I had an energy reading and we're talking about the, you know, the end of a relationship and being that transparent, being that vulnerable, it resonates with people because we all have that human emotion. So I think that if you can trust your gut and go after the things that you want and share the things that you feel compelled to share, the impact and the ripple effect can be far greater than you can even imagine. It's so true, Kimberly, because part of the things like part of that no regret living part, uh, it, 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 there, it bodies that like we talked about fearlessly moving forward, but there are some other things like the like grit. What is, what mm-hmm. is real grit? The, the resilience, you know, resilience, meaning what is your bounce back factor? So I think yeah. that what feels so inspiring is when someone, when you see someone doing well, it's easy to think that they might've had a cookie cutter, um, shiny life. And then mm-hmm. sometimes when you see what's really on the inside and you find out this person was homeless or this person suffered abuse or this person um, had a child pass away or in some cases, all of those things. Yeah. You, know, you, you, you see people that it seems like no matter what has happened to them, they have this ability to bounce back. And I think that there, there's a real inspiration there. So I appreciate you saying that. And then what, okay, so remind me what this third thing is again, because this is about Trust. you. Trusting your gut. gut. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in the TEDx talk, I share a very personal story. I'm not going to share it here because I want people to go check it out. But, you know, uh, I'll give another example. When I decided to quit my job and move abroad, this was 2013. I read the four hour work week, like probably a lot of your listeners, a lot of people in our, in our world have. And I knew instantly in my heart that this book had just changed my life had no idea what that looked like or the how, but I was like, I have been called to travel and live abroad for so long. And this book just gave me the green light by showing that it's possible. That's all I needed was proof that it was possible not to be tied to a desk. And so uh, I made this goal of six months. I wanted to be gone from my job and living overseas. And then I just started consuming all the content that I could from people who were doing just that. I read the blog posts. I listened to the podcast. I found the online internet communities of people who were location independent. And I just like, you know, ran for it. And what I found was that like that instinctual knowing that it was going to pan out, even if I had no idea how I was like, how am I going to build a business in six months that totally replaces my income? That's like pretty, pretty unrealistic if we're being honest. And, and yet I was like, it's going to work out. I just know it is. So within four months I had networked my way into one of these member communities and I'd been so in your face (laughs) about wanting to be friends with everyone and just learn from them and support them that when it came time for them to hire for a community manager, I was an easy choice. And, you know, that completely changed my life. I went and I lived overseas for a couple of years, all over Southeast Asia and Europe. My network is what it is today because of that move. Entrepreneurship led me to personal growth, which is how we're now connected. And it was all because I just trusted my gut and knew this is going to work. Like, I know that this is going to pan out well for me. So, I think that there are probably a lot of other situations in our lives that we can look back and say, oh, that didn't make any sense, but I had an internal knowing uh, and, and it panned out well. Can you, can you tell your listeners sometime in your life when that has happened? Where I trusted my gut? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I, I think I live my life by that. And yeah. I wanted to say there's something else you said that was super important. You went through an information gathering stage. So so what I'm picking up here, and actually I just last week, the, the training that I did for Fearless Ambition last week was with my friend, um, Dr. Michelle Karoulis, who is a, she's like a, like a sports not a physician, but a sports um, psychologist. So she okay. does she does uh, coaching for elite athletes and for people who want to you know get in the zone. And so she gave us these like five steps to ultimate comp- confidence. And that uh, training, by the way, is still up live on my page, Mary Shores. So if anybody wants to check that out, but guess what? So the first step 
to gaining that confidence was to gather as much information as possible. And so like, if I think about the tools that have made me successful in my life, you know, we trust our gut, but here's the thing, like there's actually steps that we don't necessarily feel as being part of our gut instincts, but all of that information that you are gathering, that you are taking in, it actually, um, contributes to your gut instincts. So when yep. you're taking that information in, it's like your body understands, yes, this is for me or no, this isn't for me. So it's going to give you the right answer. And that's yeah. the reason why it's so important to trust your gut. You know, sometimes it's been going to a particular workshop or reaching out to a particular person, um, even starting my business at 24. You know, I we're, we have a lot of similarities in that, you know, I took a really bold step when I was 24 and I opened my own company. I had no idea what was going to happen. I didn't really make any money for the first two years. I had a young family yeah. and those were, those were the big things that I followed my gut and I said yes to. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's other things too. It's almost like that taking a leap of faith. So I would say something more recently is, um, a lot of the traveling that I've been doing. And, oh, so here's one. My son is on the spectrum. So he is now, he just had his 18th birthday. His name is Keegan. And last summer, at the very last minute, I found out about a program at New York Institute of Technology, which is this amazing program that's a transition. It's called um, Introduction to Independence. So okay. it's, a, it's a transition program for people on the spectrum for their formative years between high school and college. Yeah. And so he, it was a very expensive program. I didn't really know how I was going to pay for it um, or if I could even get him get him accepted because I literally applied two weeks before we had to leave. But yeah. I did it and I got all the paperwork in. I did all of the things. I didn't worry about the money. And it really was a life-changing experience for him because he got to he got to live in a dorm. He, you know, was responsible to do his own laundry. He worked an internship. So he got like this work experience. He worked at an electronics recycling um, company. He also took all of these, I, I like to call them adulting classes, but like yeah. for example, he was getting paid for this internship so he had a bank account that he had to manage and a debit card and they took banking classes and they took budgeting classes and then here's another really miraculous thing so if anybody has a child on the spectrum they're going to understand why this is so um, groundbreaking for us is that every weekend they took weekend trips to the city. So this was um, in the Long mm. Island area and they would literally get on the train and every weekend they went into the city. They had to buy their own tickets. They had to yeah. manage all of that travel. Of course they did it as a group, but like, I think that something like that to me opens up a whole new world. And yeah. so the thing is that a lot of people, if they hear about an opportunity, they just immediately go, no, I can't do that. Or no, I can't afford that. Or no, you know, whatever. They just go, no, but my gut was pulling me towards it. So it's like, well, how can I do this? Yeah. And I'm not saying that you're going to be able to, you know, mm -hmm. say yes to everything that ever comes into your life. But when you feel it in that gut and it's, and, and if you try to ignore it, it just gets louder. Mm -hmm. Then that's really, I think the time to pay attention. Yeah. I mean, I'll be completely honest. Like when I had the idea to do a TEDx talk, I hadn't done any speaking up until that point. I mean, I was in Toastmasters and it felt kind of organic and I'd had a couple speeches there and done like one workshop. So it wasn't as though I was, you know, 10 years into my brand, 10 years into my business and a prolific speaker. That's not what was going on, but it just felt so right. And it's the only time I've ever been on a stage or had to get up and present in front of people that I wasn't nervous in my entire life. It was the only time I wasn't nervous. And because I genuinely feel like I was, I was, walking the walk and just being bold enough to own the message and own the the position that I was stepping into of leadership. So I think that so much comes from that. And I would have insane regret if I'd never pursued that opportunity because I thought like, who am I to have a TEDx talk? You know, it, uh, I'm just very grateful. So trust your gut. <laughs> Yeah. And you were very well prepared for that. And it showed, cause I remember asking you about it and you were like, I wasn't nervous at all. And I was like, wow. That was an incredible thing to say. So, it's a very um, out of body thing to say, cause I'm not a not nervous person when it comes to speaking. 
So we've got about 10 minutes left. So if anybody has any questions for Kim, um, go ahead and put them up. And Kim and I will be starting to wrap up just talking about anything else with no regret living and what that, I would love to hear from you what the outcome of that. So if you have a question either on the Facebook Live or in Zoom, just put it up there. And if you're on our Zoom link and you actually want to um, speak to us, I can totally turn your audio on or even your camera if you, if you wanted to do that, just to, just to say hello. So tell me, Kim, what is the results of what you've noticed change in your life? Which, I mean, obviously the four-hour workbook, we, work week completely changed your life. Tell me a little bit how the Bold Life Movement and the No Regret Living has changed it as well. Sure. So I have a really recent example. I mean, holistically, leaving the country and moving abroad has opened up so many doors that I never could have imagined. So that's, I mean, my network is just the richest, most amazing group of, of individuals all over the world, and I'm beyond grateful. So life is all about relationships. Have to, have to acknowledge that. But uh, a recent example of sort of throwing caution to the wind and just trusting my, my gut was... I had a relationship end, something one that I was extremely passionate about and saw a future in. Complete surprise to me. And I thought, I just had this idea. What if I go to Bali? Like, what if I eat, pray, love my way out of this heartbreak? And I happen to have a, a flight pass right now that allows me to fly sort of last minute. And it not something I, I normally have. It's just like, everything was sort of lining up. So I made this decision to go to Bali, ended up having three good friends there, completely separate groups of people, but they're all there at the same time. It was the most supportive environment that I could have been in. And since then I had uh, a new best friend come out of it. I had a new podcast series come out of it. I've learned so much about myself, my energy, um, different styles of yoga, different healing modalities that I wasn't exposed to before, which I just love. I mean, I think that we're both kind of workshop self-improvement junkies and and it was just one of the richest experiences that wouldn't have happened if I'd if I'd gotten in my head about it. And it's just there are so many, so many stories like that where it's like get on the plane, go to the event, go talk to the guy, go talk to the girl, go reach out to the mentor you know, no matter how many, um, or no, sorry, no matter how much we can create reasons or excuses why we shouldn't, I feel like if you, if you feel called to it, then you always should. And it always turns out well. So for me, that's what leading a bold life is all about is just being brave enough to actually make your life what you would want it to be. If money wasn't an issue, people's judgment wasn't an issue. And, uh, yeah, that's sort of where I'm at. I love this. So all recently, and this is this is kind of in summary of what I just heard you say, which was an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. It's this, um, lately I've been talking a lot about the difference between creation and manifestation from a state of mind of empowerment mm -hmm. versus creation and manifestation from disempowerment. Because, you mm -hmm. know, when we're talking about concepts like spirituality, law of attraction, or whatever you want to call it, it doesn't even really matter. But I think that we're accepting that infinite possibilities exist for us and that yeah. we have a lot of control in how we're creating our own realities. Well, one of the things that I really um, have been paying attention to in the last couple of months is this empowerment factor because a lot of people will say it's so important um, to pay attention to how you feel but I can I concern myself with how that doesn't really allow us um, a to way to bad. process yes how to yeah. process so like as you're going through this breakup and I went through a breakup a year ago as well and it was devastating so mm -hmm. and it was actually right before my book was coming out so it was it Ugh. was really a problem right yeah <laughs> anyway, the timing's not great it was not good timing but it, <laughs> but it was perfect timing timing, but it, right. it was what it was supposed to be. And totally. so here's what I learned, and I'll share this with the audience today, that everything that you create from this place of empowerment is going to show up in your life stronger, faster, better, um, easier. Everything will just line up. And here's the most important part. It will be more impactful 
Okay. Mm -hmm. But everything that you create from this opposite plane um, of disempowerment is going to be stressful, chaotic. It's going to, it's, it's that feeling like you're walking through the mud and you just can't, like you feel almost like it's cement. You just can't move. And yeah. the impact is going to be not very good or even a negative impact to your life. And so when you are going through something that has you feeling disempowered, and let's face it, if you've ever gone through a breakup, it is a disempower. It's very disempowering. Yeah. You feel lost. You feel, I think it's one of the worst feelings that you can go through. And yeah. so what I love, and this is what I encourage people to do, is that that is the time to go within. This is yes. not the time to be working on some massive creation project. This is the time to go within because when you take the time, it's okay to be in, um, it's okay when shit hits the fan in your life. That is a sign that it's time to take care of yourself. So by, you know, look at what you did. You, you invested in, in yourself by, um, you, you were surrounded by these three loving groups of people who yeah. supported you and, um, also, I love it that you started to explore yoga and that you were exploring all of these healing modalities because that is exactly what I mean. Because people will ask me when I'm on a podcast, well, what do you do to go from empowered to disempowered? And that is exactly what you do. Okay. Yeah. So what you do is you invest in your own healing, whatever that may be. Sometimes it's just an acute stress and all you really need to do is like decompress or take a deep breath. <laughs> Um, sometimes it's something deeper and, and you'll, if you take that moment to explore yourself, the gift will be your knowledge will grow exponentially. And that's what happened yeah. to you. I think, I mean, you nailed it on the head. One of the biggest struggles that I had when I was over in Bali a couple months ago, aside from just feeling the pain was that I didn't want to feel the pain anymore. You know, I was like, this is, this isn't me. Like all these new amazing people that I'm connecting with, they're not seeing me at, at my most lit up. I don't feel like my radiant self. I don't feel as playful as, as I know that I am. And a, a good friend of mine, he was so sweet. He was like, you're still that person. Like when the clouds are there, that doesn't mean that the sun no longer exists. The clouds, you know, come and go. So just focus on the fact that the sun is still behind them. And he, he said it so much more poetic than I am. Uh, it was a very pithy text that he sent, but <laughs> it, it resonated because I was like, you're right. Like this is the time when you do the healing modalities, when you journal or not journal, if that's what feels right. It's, it's all about doing whatever gets you back to that place of knowing what the truth is. And the truth is that Heartbreak pain does not last forever. The truth is that there are, you know, 3 billion other men or women in the world, depending upon your preference. And the truth is that you are still the same person at your core. So I just think that there is something so brave about acknowledging emotion, being able to move through it and, and allow yourself the time and space to come out on the other side, because you do, you want to be aligned before you take action or you want to be empowered before you start uh, working on creating and manifesting. So I love that point. I could talk about this stuff all day. That's it's so true. So, <laughs> all right, well, tell us how we can find you. And I also want to hear about your new podcast and then we will wrap up. And I just want everyone to know that um, when we send you the replay, um, we will put the link so everyone who registered for this today will get a link to the recording as well as I'll send you the link to Kim's TED Talk because I love it. I've watched it like I'm guilty of uh, watching it like 17 times. And then we've been oh, yeah. watching on Facebook Live. We've actually already um, put the link up in the comments and probably pinned it as well. So that's really easy for you to find. But I know because I looked this morning, if you want to, you can actually just go to YouTube and put in Kim Rich TED Talk and it will be the first thing that comes up. So, all right. How That's good to you? know. Uh, yeah. The bold life movement.com is where everything lives. You can get all my socials there, which is just the bold life movement on Instagram and, uh, and on Facebook. And then you can also get access to all the podcast episodes, which if you're on Spotify or you're on, um, iTunes, Stitcher, whatever your, your podcast platform of choices, the bold life movement, super easy to find. And yeah, you can see the, the videos, get the audio. And then there's also the four part mini series that I did with my friend Katie B. It's called 
uncut with Kim and Katie B. This is the friend that I met in Bali where we just go, go deep, get real personal. And it's super, super uncut and raw. And I love it. I love it too. I like the uncut with Katie and Kim. So yeah, I'll be checking that out. And Kim, thank you so very much. Have yeah. a wonderful flight later today. Thank you. I'm so excited to dive back into your book. I mean that genuinely. I'll text you later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then also let me know if you're going uh, to Chicago to UPW. Because I'll be my, there. My All family. Right. Yeah. We'll have to do some uh, Facebook lives there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much to everyone that watched and that listened. Feel free to message me on Instagram. I love hearing from people or shoot me an email. All right, sweetie. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Hey, this is Mary. Thanks so much for watching. Check out a free chapter of my book, Conscious Communications at maryshores.com forward slash free chapter. The link is in the description below.